Hello, everyone. We are really thrilled to see that uh, you're sticking it out. And that's great because we have an awesome talk for you up next. Um, Annalisa Cadonna is going to talk about Bayesian thinking. Annalisa has been in academic research for eight years and she switched to industry uh, during the lockdown. So already a difficult enterprise making the switch uh, and she mastered it um, with the extra difficulty and obstacles uh, of lockdown. And now she's going to explain to us everything we want to know about Bayesian statistics. Go, go, go. Hi, everyone. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the nice introduction. I, as Rania said, I switched to industry in May. So actually after this conference was supposed to take place, I'm now a senior data scientist at Crayon at the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence for Europe that was born in Vienna about a year ago. And I, I joined uh, um, five months ago. Before that, uh, I was in, uh, in the university and after my PhD, I moved to Vienna, which is a beautiful city, to be an assistant professor at VU, the Virsha University of Technology and Business. And so the research I've done over the years has been in Bayesian statistics uh, and of course approached as a researcher. And since this talk comes in this moment where I did the switch, I thought about thinking about how Bayesian statistics and Bayesian thinking in data science can contribute to the industry and why I think it should be in any data science toolkit. So um, before I start, I would also say that I really appreciate this initiative and I would also like to do a shout out, uh, shout out to the R Ladies. So the R Ladies is a community of, uh, of uh, women and minority genders, but of course everyone is welcome, that uh, is a global movement to promote diversity and inclusion in our communities. And the Our Ladies Vienna was founded by two of my colleagues of VU and friends, uh, Laura Vanna and Camilla Damian. And uh, we are, we are um, of course, there was the lockdown, but we are preparing some new exciting meeting. The first one will be a talk at the end of October. So please uh, um, join the Our Ladies on Meetup if you are interested. And I would like to say that it's all about inclusion. It's not that if you use Python in your daily work, you cannot come to the Our Ladies meeting. Anyone, because there is always, so I, I myself now I'm using Python in my daily job. Uh, but, and everyone is welcome from students that are just starting to very experienced data scientists that want to know how, how R works. And uh, yeah. Now I will share my screen. Hopefully it works. Okay. Great. Okay, so if you have worked with data or you have worked in a, in a data science environment or you have taken a statistics class, for sure you have encountered Bayesian statistics. Either you have worked with Bayesian statistics or you have heard about it. And I'm not talking about the, the base theorem that everyone sees in, in college. And what you have heard probably is that it's really cool, but it's really complicated. And you've probably heard that one of the main advantages is that you can incorporate domain expertise and your expert information directly in your model. And something else you've heard is probably that it provides a natural probabilistic framework and you can really uh, do a, a good uncertainty quantification that is not based on p-value and confidence intervals. And also you have probably heard that is the way to go when you work with small data. So usually when I meet data scientists and they know I've done research for 10 years in Bayesian statistics, the first question is, ah, okay, cool. Can you explain Bayesian statistics to me? So in case you're not familiar with it, I'm gonna do the two minutes Bayesian statistics elevator pitch. 
but then talk about why I think uh, this way of thinking in data science is important. So when you approach a problem in the Bayesian way, the secret is you actually do it the, the way you do in the frequentist way and in any other way. The first thing you think about is the model for your data. So what problem is this? Is this a problem in which I have linearity or non-linearities? What kind of data I have? Is numerical, is categorical, and so on. And you build a model for your data. Then comes the, let's say, a bit different part. And this is introducing the prior information. And this is done through the so-called prior distribution. This has been a little controversial over the years, but think about an expert that already have, has knowledge on a topic and could contribute that knowledge directly in your model. Once you have defined these two things, you put them together, you fit your data, and to an estimation procedure, you get your so-called posterior distribution. And the posterior distribution is simply the distribution of all the parameters of your model, given that you observe the data. I'll give now a really simple toy example. Keep my slide, okay. Great. Um, so let's assume you want to check if your friend that is, that is betting with you and is flipping a coin is actually being fair or not. So the model for your, you want to count the number of successes. So let's say the, num the, the, the number of times and you want to model the probability of flipping heads. If you think about the model for your data, when you model the number of successes, you're talking about a binomial distribution with a parameter that is the probability of success. You know by your experience that this probability is going to be around 50%. But maybe you're not so certain about it because of, because of your friends, or maybe you look at the coin and you know, you're not really sure. So what you can do, you can put a prior information and say, okay, I do think the probability is around 50% and you can also express how certain you are about this. So this is a probability distribution and the probability distribution of, let's say, your belief, what you believe before observing the data. The cool part is when you actually observe the data. So let's say your friend flips the coin a hundred time, times and he gets about 20 times uh, uh, tail and about 80 times head. At this point, you want to update your belief because you do have evidence in the data, right? And the data is telling you that out of these 100 times, 80 times head was flipped. You go through your estimation procedure that in this toy example is simply an analytical calculation, but in more complex examples, it's gonna be an algorithm and you obtain the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution is basically is a distribution over the parameter, for the parameter once you observe your data. And this is the main difference with frequency statistics. Instead of finding a point estimator and with, for example, a standard error, you get the entire distribution. And here is why people say that uh, uh, uncertainty quantification is, you know, is intrinsic in the Bayesian framework because you can say anything you want about this distribution, right? So, as you probably know, the Bayes theorem was uh, formulated or at least published first by Reverend Tom's Bayes. Uh, we don't really know if this is Tom's Bayes, Tom Bayes, but this is the picture that everyone uses, so I stick with it. <laughs> and uh, I'll, you are familiar probably with the Bayes theorem for events, and I'll present here, let's say, the Bayes theorem for Bayesian statistics. The first part here is simply the model for the data. So this is called the likelihood and you are familiar for it, with it if you ever do maximum likelihood estimation. And this is the first thing you focus on, right? So the starting point is the same as with any other approach. You think about the model for your data given your parameter, but you do wanna have actually the distribution of your parameter given the data and the base theorem is simply a trick to invert this conditionality. So you multiply by your prior, right? And you obtain the so-called posterior distribution. What you see here at the denominator is the marginal distribution is just a normalizing constant. 
And now we really say we don't care about it. But if you think about it, what this is, is the integral over the parameter. So before the advent of methods like Markov chain Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo integration, this was super complicated to calculate. So until the 50s, Bayesian statistics was just a, a nice theoretical tool, let's say a philosophy, but could not actually be used in practice. Then in the 50s, with the advent of the first computers and with the advent of these, uh, these random algorithms, uh, that's when Bayesian statistics could actually be put in practice. So this was the short introduction to Bayesian statistics and usually people are impressed, but then the question is, okay, but how do you practically do it? And this is a good question because there is not one solution fits all. Like with any other data science mod, a problem, a machine learning problem, you have to think about it. Bayesian statistics is not just a tool that you say, okay, I'm gonna use Bayesian statistics and this is going to work, right? So what I want to focus on now is uh, on one hand, uh, try to explain why I think a probabilistic approach to data science is important and why maybe it is worth it to overcome this lack of practicality. And on the other hand, uh, uh, having recently switched to industry, where do I see we can actually apply this and what, are, what is the state of the art uh, uh, in terms of making these tools uh, um, more available? What I think is the main advantage of Bayesian statistics is actually something that is not Bayesian per se. And it is that you need to think about the model very carefully. And this is because if you want to apply the Bayes theorem, you need to understand your model. And if you want to insert your expert information in your model, you need to know exactly where to put it. So you can build really complex systems, complex models, and consider all sorts of dependencies that could be temporal, that could be spatial, that could be in groups, across groups, but you need to know exactly each parameter, which role this has. So I think the main advantage is that it allows you to build interpretable complex models. And I think this is important nowadays, and we have talked about it, the other speakers have also talked about it, because, you know, uh, we can build complex models, right? We can use deep learning and we have the so-called black box. And it's not really a black box, it's just a super highly nonlinear function. And it's so nonlinear that we as humans cannot really understand what's going on. And so I think that is cool. They give you, the, it gives you super accurate prediction, but there are cases in which having a super accurate prediction is not enough. There are cases in which you really want to understand what's going on in your box. And this is, this is something that uh, I see and it is becoming always like more present in our society since as has been told before by Julia, machine learning models, AI are really shaping everyone's daily life. So if you wanna build a model that allows you to make decisions that influence uh, people's job and influences people's life and how people spend time, then you need to first understand the model and second, understand how certain you are about your conclusion. And these are two things that are inner, inner, inherent to the Bayesian framework. And you would say, and I completely agree, that you build interpretable complex models, you do not need to be Bayesian. You can do it in the frequentist way. There is an issue that there are a lot of models that if you do not use a Bayesian approach, you really cannot solve. You cannot estimate a solution. So this is because the likelihood is just simply not really nice. Maybe it's multimodal and you might lose the, the one of the mods or maybe the, 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 the mode is at the border and this is a problem with a, with a frequentist approach. And you don't really need to go too complex. Think about this example. You, you consider school in the schools in the same school district. So you assume there is a, some, they have some sort of commonality and something shared across schools. Let's say you wanna build a model that explains a score in a standardized test in 2020 based on a score in the previous year. You might expect that the effect 
is different for each school. Why? Because a school might have put extra effort in the teaching, in extracurricular activities, there might be a new teacher joining, and these are all things that you cannot control by simply adding other predictors. And you, when you want to do this, you know what to do, right? You, you write a random effect model, which has an intercept that varies and with groups, and it has a slope that also varies between groups. And I think you are all with me when I say that when you try to fit a random effect model, it's a bit of a pain. You, a lot of the time, you get this singular fit error, and what this basically means is, okay, there is not enough data or there is not enough information in your data to solve this problem. So what do you do at that point? If I know, if I believe that there is a, that the, the, the slope and that the fact of my predictor is different with the, between groups, what do I do? I have two decisions. Either I drop it and I consider a common slope. And this is also an assumption and a subjective choice. Or I might say, you know, I sure, I'm sure there is a, a difference between groups. And so I include this in my model through my prior. And this is simply comes down to put a prior on the variance of the random effects and kind of bounding it away from zero. This is a bigger field of application and I think it's really common, this problem is really common in medical studies. Think you have 50 subjects and for each subject, for each patient, you, co you, you collect uh, hundreds or thousands of indicators of biomarkers. Uh, this is the typical problem that is called uh, uh, a small n large p problem. We know that with that usual approach, this problem is simply not solvable. Even if you do a linear regression, your x transpose x is not full rank, is not invertible. This is an ill posed problem. There are ill posed problems that are really ill, Ill posed, like you cannot solve analytically, and there are problems that are ill posed numerically. For example, your predictors are so correlated that you have not enough observation to come up with, come up with an estimate of, your, your, of all your parameters. And you know what is the approach in this case is usually regularization. Lasso, elastic, net, ridge regression. The definition in optimization, the definition of regularization is simply when you have an ill pose problem, you add external information in order to solve it. And this approach is Bayesian in nature. And if you take any regularization method like a penalized likelihood, ridge, elastic net, this can be written as a likelihood times a Bayesian prior. So my takeaway here would be that it doesn't matter if you're a frequentist or Bayesian, right? The met it matters how you approach the problem and how can you find a solution for a specific problem. So what I told you up, up to now is that one of the Bayesian, the advantages of this Bayesian, or let's say probabilistic, because you don't need to be Bayesian approach, is that you can build interpretable complex models you can deal with small data and with small data, I don't mean only when you have just a few observations, but also when your data is very noisy and there's not enough signal in your data. And you can do regularization and you can solve problems in which the number of observation is smaller than the number of parameters. And before we have talked about uncertainty quantification. And if you think about uncertainty quantification, this simply means that I don't give you only a point estimate, but I also give you an interval that can be actually interpreted as a probability, right? And in the two examples I gave, this is also the case. For example, in the schools, I want to understand the effect of the previous years. Maybe this could be used for funding, right? And of course, in the medical field, if you're a doctor and you get a prediction from the model, you want to know how sure you are, right, about that prediction. And I've talked about all these cool things, and I didn't really answer the question, how do you do it in practice? In the past um, years, I've worked in academia, and I have to say, practicality was never the issue there. 
So we would spend days or weeks coming up with the best possible model for a problem, and then maybe other weeks implementing the best algorithm. And we did try to build an algorithm with a parameterization in a way that it would converge fast. You know, we went to C, C++, we didn't do for loops in R or Python. And even with all of these, sometimes we had to wait hours or days to get a result. In that case, there was not a problem because, you know, the goal was to advance knowledge and probably to publish a paper. And there was no deadline for that or not customer asking you for results. But time is an issue in industry and not only the time that you take running the algorithm, but also the time that you spend implementing the algorithm. So I think estimation is the biggest blocker and the biggest pain point for why Bayesian methods are not that popular in industry, but is also a pain point that is being addressed. And there is a lot of research done, not all in academia, but also in big tech companies. One solution might be probabilistic programming languages. So what are probabilistic programming languages? The main thing they provide for you is an inference algorithm. So you do not have to write the algorithm yourself. The algorithm is provided by you, for you. This might be through um, automatic differentiation or a metropolis algorithm. Every probabilistic programming language uses a different kind of algorithm but they all give you approximation to the posterior distribution. And how do you use this? Well, first you write your model, right, in code. So you write your 10, 20, 30 lines of code for the probabilistic model. Once you have written the, 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 the model, then you fit your data and the model to the inference algorithm, right? So the algorithm is translating your model into code for you or into lower level code for you, and you get out the posterior distribution. Why do I think this has a lot of potential and this is really cool? Well, first of all, it hides the complexity of Bayesian inference and it allows more people to use it. Second, I think it separates the algorithm from the model. So if I look at this domain specific language, which is probabilistic, right? I can understand exactly what is going on. Third, and this is not less important, it might avoid some bugs. So every time you have to write your own algorithm for a new problem, you might, or at least I do, introduce a few bugs. Um, there are so many probabilistic programming languages and it's so interesting to know that uh, uh, big tech companies in the Silicon Valley, for example, are really investing a lot of funding and a lot of resources in this. Pyro, for example, which is based on PyTorch, was originated at Uber. Tensor for probability was originated at Google, Google Brains, and Infernet.net is a .NET uh, probabilistic programming languages, I will say PPL, because <laughs> it's long, <laughs> PPL uh, from Microsoft. The one maybe you're most familiar with is STAN. STAN is really used in academics, academics, but STAN is also used, for example, by Facebook. Not only STAN is the backbone for um, Facebook Profit, which is the Facebook tool for doing time series analysis, uh, Facebook's also investing funding in research to how to make STAN, STAN better. And JAX and BAX are programming languages themselves. And these have been around for long because I remember using them in 2010. So they're academic and they've been around for longer. What I'm exploring with right now is PyMC3, which is a Python library based on Theano. So it looks like we have completed the circle. So what I want to conclude is that, um, first of all, I wanted to say again that the talk was not about please be Bayesian and don't be frequentist. The talk was about um, the approach and an approach to uh, data science that I think should be in any data science toolkit. And 
he also not about not using deep learning because deep learning methods are super cool and in some cases you have to use them. It's also true that there is a lot of research in explainability, so to explain what's actually going on in the black box that are uh, um, the, the deep learning models. In this case, though, we are talking about understanding the model before fitting it to the algorithm. So with this probabilistic approach, you can build interpretable complex models and you can actually find solutions for it. You can incorporate domain knowledge and we always talk in industry about, uh, uh, you know, talk with the domain expert, talk with the stakeholder, try to, to incorporate this knowledge in your model. You can use it for small data. And in the case of small data, actually you can leverage information for heterogene from heterogeneous sources. And so you can actually maybe even get better accuracy. Uncertainty quantification, which is, you know, is natural in every person's way of reasoning. Is, is intrinsic in this probabilistic approach to data science. You can do regularization or every techniques that are applicable when you, with basically high dimensional data, and it helps you with the course of dimensionality. And what is still missing is this sort of practicality, being able to put this kind of model into production. But it seems like with the, with the probabilistic programming languages, uh, uh, there have been like giant steps in that direction. So thank you. And from my point of view, I also because I'm new to the field as a profession, I would like to know if you do use in your daily work Bayesian methods and uh, probabilistic programming languages. Thank you very much, Annalisa, for this great talk about Bayesian statistics. Um, we, we have a few questions here in the Q&A. Uh, I'll ask you first the, the more specifically uh, Bayesian one and then a more uh, general question. Um, so the question is, how is it that the probabilistic model generates the inference algorithm? Do you use a training set? Yes. Uh, yes, the way you approach the problem is exactly the same that you would approach it in your usual way. So you do, you can separate your data in training and test and fit your model to the training set uh, and look at your uh, at how well your model is performing in the test set and not only this you at that point you will not compare a point estimate with your uh, your your data your observation in the in the test set what you can do is actually have an entire distribution for your prediction and actually see where the observation in the test set fall so about probabilistic programming languages, um, the, the inference is based on, well, the general idea is Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the general idea is basically if you keep conditioning one parameter over all the others and the data, and you run this, uh, like, you know, as long enough, then you get an approximation of the posterior distribution. And this is usually done by calculating this algorithm by hand, but probabilistic programming languages do, do an approximation and, and they work great. Um, another interesting question. Um, so you, you say domain knowledge can uh, flow into a probabilistic model more easily. How do you quantify it? Where does it go into the model? Yes, and, and this is the really tricky part, right? Because what you have to do is to translate domain knowledge into probability distribution functions or probability mass functions. So there are, so there are, there are cases in which this is, is easy. And the, the way it usually is done is, you know, you ask about uh, an estimate and you ask about the uncertainty and maybe then you match the first and the second moment and you use, you use a prior for this. This could also be um, a little bit more vague, let's say, 
So you could, you could say, okay, I, you know, I, I played safe. I just use the estimate and I put more uncertainty and my data, if I have enough data, will, will learn itself. And to add here is that if the data contains enough information and you have enough data, then this is going to override the prior information. So you need to think about it as just as, as some data, right? That instead of coming from a collection, come from people that have experience. Um, so, do you need to know a lot of math? Basic, basically, the question is asking, do you need to know a lot of math in order to pursue data science? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, uh, um, from, from a personal journey, um, I, I did not study math. I studied biomedical engineering for my bachelor uh, for many reasons, most of which being, you know, if you're studying engineering, then you can have, get a practical job at the time. That's what I was hearing. Uh, and then I realized the part I liked most about engineering was math and I kind of switched direction and studied mathematical engineering. But I would not say my background is in pure math and my, you know, and my math knowledge is top notch. What I think is uh, you should know some math and you should be interested in probability theory. And in my opinion, a purely computer, computer uh, um, science background is not enough if you want to think about, about the models. Yeah. Um, so we have um, I'm going to add my little two cents to this question <laughs> um, because I am a mathematician um, and as much as it hurts me to say this, uh, most of you don't really need to be a mathematician to be a data scientist, ouch, uh, and actually most of my colleagues are not mathematicians. Um, data science is a huge field and it welcomes people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, and this is really important. Uh, we need people who are coming in from not just from computer science, math, statistics. Uh, we need the domain experts. We need people who have a business background, people who have a psychology, social sciences, uh, arts, um, Actually, there is a huge field in data visualization, so uh, people with an arts background often feel comfortable there. So the point is, um, it's not one background. Uh, it's really diverse, and the more we have from different perspectives, the better it is. So uh, on this note, uh, I would like to hand off to Karina, I'm going to ask you to stay because we're, we're going to have, we can have a chatting and networking session once this is over. Um, and I'll let Karina take over from here. But first of all, oh, so first of all, a big applause for our last speaker, Annalisa. Woo! So one second. Um, Actually, Rania, with these words, you almost did the closing, I would say. <laughs> so it's hard to me to catch up. Uh, one second, so there we are. But, so we are super, super trooper excited that this day finally happened, that now we kicked off this community of women in data science. And um, first of all, I have three big thank, you, thank yous to make. First is to our sponsors and partners, especially BDO who would have hosted us and we are developers who is now hosting us <laughs> in this uh, different format. And also the newspapers who were um, publishing about us and uh, all the support we got on social media and so on. Second, I really want to thank our speakers. It was wonderful to have you here, to get your insights. Thank you for your time on a Saturday morning. The weather was nice and you came here to share your know-how with the community and really uh, demonstrated the different perspectives uh, that data science brings with it.
And also a big thank you to the speakers we would have had in the physical format, but who couldn't, that actually we shortened the program for the digital version uh, to make sure you make it through it. Uh, but they are going to be announced soon and there will be follow-ups. And here comes the third thank you, which goes to you to really stick until the end on this beautiful day here with us to celebrate woo, this um, first ever uh, to happen women, uh, women in data science uh, meeting. And uh, we're really happy and we're looking forward to future events. So this is our call on you please follow us on social media and other channels on the website of the Vienna Data Science Group, for example, to stay tuned about our future events, talks and um, conferences. And if you have content that you really think that is never discussed, that should be discussed, or even you have something that you would like to share with everyone and you think the world should know it, get in touch with us and we will see what we can do. But for sure, this is not going to be the last event. So follow us, stay tuned.